And Jessica, are you able to hear us okay? Uh oh. Jessica, are you able to hear us okay now? All right, thank you. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. So I'm uh, going to start and then Catherine will go second. Perfect. Uh, so last time we did this, your name, uh, there's like a name that shows and it, it kind of covers like a little bit of the screen below you. So if you could move your camera to point a little lower, I think, because um, it was blocking some some of the hands, the hand signing last time. All right, I'll scoot back a little bit and then make sure I'm up. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Shane, for that, because uh, we had a parent uh, from Terra Silva that uh, yes. had mentioned that. She really appreciated having the interpreter. She mentioned, oh, at times the, the name tag was or the name was in the blocking yes. some of the time. We're, get, we're getting better every time. Joanne Medina, can you look at what I just sent you? Ms. Cordon, are you able to hear us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Ms. Peterson. Good evening, Mr. Pinnell. Ms. Haro? Yes, ma'am. I am going to send you a text right now. I think we're going to have to amend the agenda. And I will provide you the details right now. Okay. Dr. Peterson, that's item 4.2. Dr. Peterson, was that item 4.2 correct? I believe so. I need to pull that up. It's 5.30, so. Dr. Miranda is having trouble issues getting on. Okay. Just yeah, 4.2. Okay. All right, there we go. Can you hear me, Joanne? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay Miss Sarah, I just sent that to you. Okay, I got it. So, Dr. Peterson, we are going to amend that item to reflect that new cost. Thank you, Joanne. No problem. Okay. I'd like to call. The July 30th, 2020 board meeting to an order. Uh, Joanne, would you like to do roll call attendance? Sure. Can anybody hear me? Uh, board member Fuentes. Here. Board member Adigui? Here. Board member Sandoval? Here. 
Board Member Haro. Here. Board Member Thori Nojeda. Here. Board Member Flores. Here. Member Ibarra. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. I'd now like to ask Dr. Miranda to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Put the right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miranda. Of the July 30th agenda. I'd like a motion to adopt the agenda with the following amendment. Item 4.2 to reflect the cost of Odyssey Wear is 146500 Do I have a motion to approve the agenda with the amendment? So moved. Second, Dan Flores. I have a motion by board member Fuentes and a second by board member Flores to adopt the agenda with the one amendment to item 4.2. Joanne, would you like to do a roll call vote? Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Marino Hayda? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Mrs. Adigin? Yes. Thank you. Moving on to 2.0, our public comment. Um, Joanne, would you like to please read us our public comments for this evening? Yes. I will start the timer. The first public comment is Griselda Rodriguez, a parent and an employee. Hello, superintendent, board members, staff members, and our community. Hope you and your families are well. Are all well. We are good, thank God. I am Griselda, a proud parent, community member, and employee at CJUSD. I respect everyone's beliefs, thinking, comments, suggestions, and decisions. We are all at risk anywhere we are, go, or do. Not everything is being disclosed to us. Practicing social distancing and hygiene is very important, yet we are still exposed. We all matter and are essential in many ways everywhere. We should adapt and continue with precautions to new ways of learning, living, just like we all do as people, employees, school districts, homemakers, takers, businesses, and more. Safety first responders, medical, education, grocery market, department stores, etc. I would like for students to do both, return to school for a day, days, hours, partially, and continue with distance learning. Improve attendance on campus safety and health procedures for all students, staff, and community. Remote learning improved procedures to engage students in learning and participation. Students should be able to meet individually and virtually with teachers and classmates as well. Not only class meetings. I not only agreed, but understand Mr. Dan Flores as a parent's experience of how challenging it is to help our own children at home with distance learning. A lot of instructions to explain and go over and time needed to sit one on one with my kinder at the time. Although I did enjoy being a parent teacher, became familiar with online apps such as group class, seesaw, Cisco meeting, Zoom, etc. I also guided my child to participate in the Think Together summer program. We enjoyed it. It's not easy for our students and parents, especially having language barriers, working parents, students being helped by other family members in the home, child care providers, etc. I also strongly agreed with board members that the first day of school will be very important. I asked my five children for their individual input comments. Please cons also consider their theirs and all student voices when making the best decisions. Daughter, Colton student at Bernie Elementary School, first grade. I like and would rather go back to school in the class classroom where I can see my teacher and classmates. At home, I would do classwork, but nobody is saying anything. Daughter, Colton student at middle school, eighth grade. I do not enjoy distance learning and would prefer to return to class. It's hard to complete online work when you're on your own. It's not as easy as having someone help you in person. I know that going back to school is not safe at the moment. However, I would prefer learning in a classroom environment. 
Class meetings were kind of weird with no one showing themselves and only the teacher would be talking and it was kind of difficult to understand sometimes of what the person is what the person speaking is saying. It's not the same as being there to learn in person. Daughter, Colton student at high school senior. We are not going to learn in distance learning, especially starting a new year. You like Go ahead, Joanne. Okay. Uh, in new year and knowing nothing about the criteria in each subject. Students will do work to pass instead of actually learning. What's the point if no one is motivated to actually learn and easily distracted? This last time we barely zoomed, but it wasn't to learn. Daughter, Colton, former student now at San Francisco State Senior. With the spike in COVID classes, schools should not open in August. There, there's too many questions that have no way of answering yet. What if a teacher ends up getting COVID? Does a whole class get tested? Does a teacher go under quarantine paid? Do the students then go under quarantine who had contact with the teacher? What about the families the kid goes home to? Do they need to get tested in quarantine? I believe it is not safe at all to let the kids go to school, whether it's 50% in person. It should be strictly remote learning. Semester. I've had different experiences with teachers in Zoom. The strict teachers that make sure participation counts during Zoom meetings is where I learned the most. Son, Colton, an Arizona State former student. I believe that these kids are not learning anything from home. Granted, it's already difficult to keep their attention in the classroom, let alone the comfort of their own home. No one can anticipate the future or how things will go within these next few months. However, I believe that we need to learn how to adapt to these new changes and send these kids back to their classrooms. Thank you and take care. Comment number two, Rebecca Hastings, Terrace View Elementary teacher. I am Rebecca Hastings, a sixth grade teacher at Terrace View Elementary, and I'm writing to ask that you allow teachers to conduct distance learning from their classrooms. I live in a modest house that does not have a dedicated office space. I don't even own a desk. I made the last two and a half months of the 1920 school year work, but I had no idea I might be in a distance learning situation to start the 2021 school year. I conducted my lessons from my dining table and basically had to leave all the accoutrements of teaching out in the middle of my house. There was no classroom door to close, no tidying up of my workspace, no desk to walk away from. There was no way to get away from work because it was always out there in the middle of everything. I would like to use my classroom because it has all the things I need to teach a live lesson, resource books, teacher guides, a large whiteboard and various manipulatives. My home doesn't have any of these things. I have heard that there is a concern about the ability to sanitize classrooms that are in use. Won't we have to figure out that when, if we go to hybrid anyway? Couldn't teachers who decide to use their classrooms do the sanitizing themselves, create a checklist, laminate it, and put it in the classrooms that are in use? I have heard that there is also concern about shared spaces like the office, teacher lounges, or restrooms. The only space that I could imagine sharing with other teachers would be a restroom which in this case too, couldn't teachers sanitize it after use, make a checklist, laminate it, and post it in the bathroom. Won't we have to figure out this if we go to a hybrid model? I would not need to use the office or teacher lounge, so these spaces shouldn't be considered shared spaces. I'm not asking that all teachers be forced to teach from our classroom. I realize it wouldn't work for everyone, but allow, the, allow those of us who want to work from our classroom. Thank you for taking the time to read this email. Sincerely, Rebecca Hastings. Public comment number three, Brandy Ritzy, Bloomington High School teacher. Brandy Ritzy, math teacher from Bloomington High School, grades nine through 12. As an 11 year veteran of CJUSD, I am absolutely appalled at how our district has handled communication for the start of the 2020 school year. The official decision to begin in distance learning came far too late in the summer. To make matters worse, CJUSD asked parents and families to make a decision about their child's education with limited information up front. While CJUSD held a parent information meeting on July 20th and subsequently posted the recording on the website, CJUSD did not widely promote the fact that it was there. CJUSD did not release communication on the social media platforms subsequently describing the options that families had to choose from. CJUSD did not disclose the social, emotional, and educational limitations you would be placing on students and families that preferred to do distance learning for the full year. Rather than promoting the choices and freely handing out the information, it was hidden on the webpage. 
our families deserve far better communication than what was been than what has been provided. Our families are our partners and we should be treating them as such. In talking with students and families from around our district, many were shocked to hear that Odyssey Wear was chosen as a platform for 7 to 12 families who preferred full distance learning. Odyssey Wear is a credit recovery platform. It is not designed for initial learning. Odyssey Wear was used as a learning platform in summer school. Did we even look at the data that came from summer school? Have we looked at the data from the credit recovery classes? Facilitated online learning is another way of telling the students and families you are on your own. But my question is why? Why are we choosing to sell families an education that is far less than what they can get from their regular teachers? Why aren't we just focusing on delivering our students a high quality education via distance learning until it is safe to return to school? There's no need to start the year by trapping students into one group or another. Let's wait until it is safe to return to campus <coughs> <clears throat> and let the families <clears throat> decide that. Miss Brandy Ritzy, math teacher, Bloomington High School. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Public comment number four, Nicole Perez, a parent. Hello, CJUSD board. I wanted to voice my concerns regarding the current situation about reopening schools. I was very disappointed in the book distribution at Colton Middle on July 29th. The line of students was almost out to the street. Crowds of students and parents confused about where to go or which way is what. I did not allow my child to participate because social dis distancing was not being followed and there was not clear instructions on direction. This district has ongoing expose exposure, so shut down at all schools. An example, Grand Terrace Elementary being the most recent for exposure. Maintenance and operation have been fogged, contaminated, fogging contaminated classrooms and asking staff to keep out for 24 hours and some staff have not been following the guidelines put in place and this is unacceptable. These are human lives being put at risk. Our students being put at risk and most of all your staff. You have seen enough by not saying anything at all. My concern is that the lunch distribution will continue ongoing exposure until all your staff is quarantined. I voiced my concerns over and over and over through your Facebook Messenger and I'm not seeing any changes. I am pleading that CJUSD do better for their staff so that they can do better for our community. Continuing to do better and put more measures in place is not enough. We need to see better now. We cannot be playing with people's lives like this. It's not fair to the employees, families, and students. I am so passionate about this. I have family that works in this district as well as children who attend this district. I want their healthy and safety to be the priority number one. Thank you, Nicole Perez. Public comment number five, Karen Swing, Grand Terrace High School teacher. I am a math and AP teacher at Grand Terrace High School. I have many concerns with the FOL, facilitated online learning model. I feel it is unfair to teachers and students, AP leadership, AVID and other electives. It is also unfair to students athletes who need the NCAA approved courses. Too many students and teachers are being excluded from teaching or attending some classes for health reasons. FOL facilitated online learning as it is, is forcing parents to choose between health and their desire and right to have the best education for their children. These classes and sports are important aspect, aspects for those students wanting to attend college and the district is abandoning them. I feel that students and teachers that have age or health reasons are unfairly treated by not allowing facilitated online learning to include these classes. Why did the district decide on facilitated online learning with Odyssey where and not just uh, distance learning as a distance learning hybrid model is starting? Teachers can do a great job teaching via distance learning. Karen Swing, teacher math AP computer science. Public comment number six. Camille Butts, Grand Terrace High School teacher. Good evening, school board members, superintendent, CJUSD employees, community members, and stakeholders. My name is Camille Butts, and I am an educator at Grand Terrace High School. Over the past several months, certificated members in ACE and the district have been working together to plan for returning to school in a distance learning format due to the current health crisis that is still unmanaged in our nation and elsewhere. I continue to applaud our choice to be in distance learning or rather health focused learning until it is safe to consider other formats of delivering instruction to the students of CJUSD. 
As we continue to make the best of the situation we are in, I implore you, the school board, to consider the following questions. To what extent were educators' voice heard and used to direct decisions the, dis the district is making regarding education in the 2020-2021 school year? To what extent is facilitated online learning via Odysseyware supporting our special populations? Namely, what options do students or educators needing or desiring to remain in distance or health-focused learning have if they want to remain part of the advanced placement or honors program our district offers? To what extent are the new responsibilities outlined in SB 98, AB 77, the trailer bill shared equitably by all CJUSD employees? To what extent is CJUSD committed to supporting Black Lives Matter? To what extent will you support Proposition 15 and guarantee, and guarantee more funding of this school district? Your answers to these questions will determine the level of success we experience in the 2020-2021 school year. As we all continue to prioritize the learning experiences of all students, we must have educators representing all levels at the table and in all levels of planning. This is the best way to guarantee that students continue to receive a high quality education. 2020-2021 will be a school year to remember. We as an entire community will decide our level of success. I wish you all good health and stamina to push through the challenges. Your to these matters is appreciated. With regards, Camille Butts, Grand Terrace High School. And that concludes public comment. Thank you, Joanne. Drink some water now. <laughs> I'm moving on to 3.0, our administrative presentation for the 2021 school year reopening. Dr. Miranda, I'd like to you to introduce your executive cabinet to present. Okay, still trying to figure out the unmute button here. Uh, thank you, Board President uh, Haro, uh, board members and community and families uh, and staff and everybody that's out there uh, tonight watching this uh, presentation. Uh, we understand there's uh, quite a bit of uh, questions out there in the community with the families. But first, what I want to do is uh, before we introduce our cabinet to do the presentation, uh, I want to thank our, our Board of Education uh, for their courageous leadership uh, way back on July 16th. Uh, you, the board, uh, made a difficult decision to uh, uh, start in distance learning and staff uh, went to work to uh, provide and, and make a plan for the 2021 school uh, reopening. And that's what you're going to see tonight. And I think uh, everybody knows that the board's top priority is the safety of our students and, for that matter, our employees. And so I, I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank uh, all our parents out there and our families and our community for your patience, uh, your uh, dedication, and I know that you care about your kids so much. To our teachers, uh, your first day back is tomorrow. I want to welcome you back. I know that you, you're waiting to hear uh, quite a bit and get some guidance. Uh, and then, of course, our staff. Uh, it's been uh, the, these difficult times have been challenging. Uh, who thought uh, when we left March 13th uh, and we closed our schools and uh, started distance learning that we start school this uh, this fall uh, in distance learning, uh, and that that was not imaginable at the time. But nevertheless, we're here. And so uh, as I wanted to let everybody know that as a parent of an eighth grade child uh, who suffers from health issues, specifically asthma, I understand the fear that's out there. And I understand as a parent how you must feel and you want the best education for your child. And, and so, so do we. Uh, so it, these difficult decisions that we're making and we're recommending tonight go through that lens. Also, I married to a first, first grade teacher uh, who teaches in a neighboring district, and we've been setting up her classroom here at home. Uh, so to the teachers that are out there, I understand how you must feel. You want to go back to your classrooms. Your classrooms is your sanctuary, and a lot. And I get that as a former teacher. I, I love being in the classroom, and, and we're trying to get you there as soon as possible. But first and foremost, we got to ensure the safety 
of our, our students and of course the you the employees. Uh, so the recommendations that, that we make uh, and that we're making tonight for the reopening are, are really uh, decisions that, that are in the best interests of our students and with uh, full consideration of everything we can with where we're at today. Only two weeks ago or approximately two weeks ago or so, the board gave us uh, direction uh, and so to move in distance learning. And so you're going to get quite a pres comprehensive presentation tonight. And I want to thank my executive cabinet, all my executive cabinet members uh, who worked together, who came together for this presentation and for their leadership through these difficult times. Uh, uh, we know that we work so hard to try to meet the needs of everybody out there and do what's in the best interest of our, what we consider here Colton Joy Unified, our family. Uh, so, with that, I want to turn it over to our assistant superintendent of student services, uh, Ms. Amanda Corden, to kick off our presentation tonight. Thank you, board president. Thank you, Dr. Miranda. Good evening, board president Haro, board members, superintendent Miranda, and members of the public. My name is Amanda Corden, assistant superintendent of student services, and I am here this evening to present our district's plan for beginning the 2021 school year. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to review some of the key points from our June 25th presentation, including our theory of action in the priority areas identified, including the health, welfare, and safety of our students and staff, providing a high quality and equitable learning experience for all, maintaining family and community engagement and communication, providing ongoing support and expanding learning opportunities for teachers, reinstating effective district operations, all while maintaining fiscal solvency. Our highest priority continues to be the wealth, or I'm sorry, the health, wellness, and safety of our students and staff. Next slide. When we initially presented our return to school plan in June, both the state of California and San Bernardino County were in stage three of a four stage roadmap, roadmap to reopening. As you recall, the task force made a recommendation to begin in stage two of our district's roadmap. Since that time, both the state of California as well as San Bernardino County have regressed to stage two. And on July 16th, the board voted to approve our plan to start the school year in stage two of distance learning. Next slide. Over the last couple of weeks, several people have been working diligently to prepare for the opening of school. Approximately 200 elementary and secondary teachers, as well as administrators, worked collaboratively in teams to identify focus areas, key standards, and rigorous lesson design to deliver distance learning in an effective manner. Resources developed by these teams will be shared with all teachers. Parent meetings were held in both English and Spanish to explain the instructional models available and to collect and answer any clarifying questions they still had. An FAQ page, as well as recordings of the presentations have been posted on the district website. A teacher meeting was also held to review the instructional models offered to parents and also to discuss elements within the trailer bill language, as well as plans for supporting students and staff during distance learning. Again, teachers were encouraged to submit questions throughout the presentation to which staff attempted to provide answers. The FAQ page, as well as a recording of the presentation have since been placed on the district intranet site. Next slide, please. School site staff work to prepare for Chromebook and textbook distribution and is currently in the process of enrolling students into appropriate tracks based on the parent choice survey. Director Kingston and Chief Technology Officer Pinnell gathered a team of teachers and other stakeholders to build a review and to build and review potential processes for collecting and documenting the mandatory student engagement data as is required by the trailer bill. They are continuing their work to finalize this process and coordinator Padilla and I are also working with a team of various stakeholders representing ACSCA management and our SROs and mental health team to develop a tiered student re-engagement plan as well. Our reopening task force core members will reconvene tomorrow to address any final details prior to opening school next week and will continue to meet as we begin to build and prepare for transition into stage three, which is our hybrid model. Next slide. 
I'd like to quickly review the instructional model options again. All students grades preschool through 12 are presented with option one first, which is a commitment to start in distance learning and transition to a hybrid model two days per week, only when it is safe to do so. If parents are not comfortable or don't think they will be comfortable with sending their student to attend class on campus at any time during the first semester, they were encouraged to choose one of the other options, which are for elementary, a full, full year or full semester distance learning, um, elementary distance learning model, or our Washington Home Choice Program. And for secondary, it was the full semester, full year facilitated online learning model, or our Washington Independent Study Program. Students whose parents did not submit a form will be placed in the distance learning with a transition to hybrid model once it is safe to do so. Next slide. So this summer we spent time reflecting and asking ourselves, what did we learn about distance learning this spring and what can we do differently in the fall? Most of our efforts involve making sure that we provide a solid instructional delivery model, which includes focused grade level content that would engage students on a daily basis. In addition, we recognize the need to provide a solid system of supports for both students and staff to assist in successfully navigating through this virtual model, whether that be in the form of academic supports or social emotional supports. One of the biggest differences involves the tracking of daily attendance and the removal of the hold harmless clause, which means that student work will now count toward their grade. This slide represents what distance learning looked like in the spring versus what it will look like in the fall. Dr. Peterson. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Corden. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to review with you the next few slides, which show the schedules for distance learning at the various grade levels. This first slide is the TK kindergarten schedule. The schedule is based on the requirement of 180 instructional minutes per day. Within the schedule will be a morning meeting with students, 15 minutes of ELD designated instruction or enrichment, 45 minutes of English language arts, 40 minutes of math, 20 minutes of science, social studies, or art, and 25 minutes to provide supports for social emotional learning, assessment, small group instruction, or additional supports. Physical education is also provided. There's some flexibility within the schedule as to the order of instruction. Next slide, please. The latter part of the day for teachers includes time for office hours and tutoring, attendance reporting, collaboration, and professional development. Next slide, please. The elementary schedules for grades one through six is based on the requirement of 230 minutes for grades one through three and 240 minutes for grades four through six. Similar to the prior schedule, you can see the time allotted for ELA and math is 60 minutes. There is time for English language development, enrichment, and PE. 40 minutes for science, social studies, and art, and 30 minutes for student support or assessment. The asterisk designates the 10 minute instructional time difference between first through third grade and fourth through six. Next slide, please. The afternoons are the same for first through sixth grade as TK to kindergarten, which allow for time to support students and time for either full staff, grade level, or vertical arts collaboration or articulation. Next slide, please. Middle school schedules include periods one to four on Monday and Thursday, periods five through seven on Tuesday and Friday, and all classes meet on Wednesday. There's time for student support and tutoring, collaboration and professional development on Wednesday. Uh, next slide, please. And the middle school schedule also involves time for office hours during the school day and time, at, time for engagement record reporting, which is now a requirement by the state and is included in all schedules. Next slide, please. Ms. Peterson, we need to pause to switch our interpreters. Okay. Okay, we are ready to go. Okay, um, next slide, please. The high school schedule will contain three periods per day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, with time for collaboration in the morning and office hours in the afternoon. Next slide, please. All six periods will meet on Wednesday with time for collaboration and professional development in the morning. Next slide, please. 
The facilitated online learning schedule includes time for daily live interaction, class time for support and tutoring for the three periods of classes, and extra time for, su for student support and tutoring and office hours in the afternoon. Next slide, please. I know there have been many questions regarding facilitated online learning, and we wanted to provide an update to the board on what we've been working on to improve this option. We've submitted the 23 courses that have been listed as action items tonight for the high school for UC um, CSU A through G approval. This means that student grades will be recognized by UC and CSU for admissions purposes. There have been requests for additional electives and our ESD 7 through 12 office is working on adding additional courses that we will bring back to the board for ratification either on August 6th or August 20th. All courses presented tonight will be submitted for NCA approval. We are working with our online curriculum pro provider on some recommendations that we must vet for each course in order to, in order to submit to NT NCAA in order to obtain this approval. Registration on the facilitated online learning platform, which is Odysseyware, will be performed by high school and middle school counselors. For high school, students can be enrolled in five to six courses, math, science, English language arts, foreign language, history, and an elective. For middle school, students can be enrolled in six courses, math, science, English, history, and two electives. Grade seven students need to be enrolled in health, so they will have only one elective uh, for the semester. We've also worked with Colton Redlands and Kaipa ROP to offer CTE online courses available for students in grades eight through 12 to take as concurrent enrollment. And students have concurrent enrollment possibilities at our local community colleges for both college and high school credit. As far as advanced placement options, Odysseyware does not provide standalone advanced placement courses. Students seeking to take AP classes will need to register on the AP Central page and be enrolled in a CJUSD approved AP course. AP requires courses to be taught by an approved AP teacher who must submit their courses online for approval. We will be discussing with some of our current approved AP teachers an opportunity to teach a course to support our facilitated online learning students. In order to support our English learners, Odysseyware offers many basic support tools built into its platform, such as translation, text-to-speech, and Odysseyware Writer to help students with the writing process. In collaboration with language support services, we are identifying specific ways of providing ELD services. We will be looking to provide an ELD teacher as their support within this program. The same process will be in place for our RSP students as we look to provide a specialized teacher and support. Next slide, please. We realize the need to provide professional development throughout the year, not only on distance learning and using instructional technology, but also subject and grade level content, social emotional learning, and we are developing a plan for culturally responsive teaching. Over the summer, we have provided opportunities for professional development through our Gates grant, which provided funding for training by QTEL and West Ed and illustrative math to over 100 teachers. Orenda provided two days of professional development this week to our Colton cohort. We provided connect with CJUSD to our new and second year teachers today. And many conferences were attended virtually by teachers over the summer. CJUSD connect is our new way of offering professional development district wide using Aludo which will give us the opportunity to provide a self-paced and gamified professional development program. This offers all departments and divisions the opportunity to provide professional development to not only teachers, but site and district classified staff or, and administrators as well. We will be providing the board a presentation on CJUSD Connect at a future board meeting. Next slide, please. And I think we're back to you, Ms. Corden. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. We do understand that our foster and homeless students may need additional supports during this time in particular. Each site has identified a liaison and will be provided with a list of foster students enrolled at their school so that they are able to notify each teacher of who the foster youth are in their classes. Our student services department will disseminate the foster youth ed rights document to all teachers, which outlines what foster youth are entitled to as far as resources. Student services will also run a weekly attendance report for foster youth and work with the school sites to provide targeted outreach to those who are absent for more than 60% of the instructional days for that week so that they can identify any barriers to participation and create a plan to address those barriers. Next slide. <clears throat> with regards to servicing our students with disabilities, there are three main considerations that we feel are imperative. First is the effective implementation of instructional accommodations and modifications. Second, 
assuring that we provide the appropriate social, emotional, and behavioral supports, and finally, maintaining a continuity of related services. RSP and SDC teachers will work to provide virtual small group instruction and individual support both in and out of the general ed class setting, and will collaborate with parents and general ed teachers and maintain consistent contact to discuss how the transition to at-home learning is impacting the students and to find out what additional supports from the school or amendments to the IEP provisions might be needed. In addition, related service providers will be continuing to provide services through a variety of virtual platforms and live interaction with students, as well as hosting office hour check-ins. Next slide. We will continue to meet the legal mandates and timelines surrounding IEP meetings and have a plan in place to make up the postponed IEPs from spring during the months of September, October, and November. We have worked collaboratively with union leadership to incorporate time into the daily schedule for teachers to collaborate and attend IEPs. And we will be utilizing the WebEx platform to hold IEPs and parents can use a computer or phone for a WebEx meeting. For those parents who might not have a computer, the parents will have the option of using their student's Chromebook as well. We will utilize a protocol in which our case carriers will reach out to the parents one to two days before the meeting to ensure that the parents are able to participate and have the necessary access. Next slide. We do recognize the importance of supporting our teachers and support staff during this time. We have assigned teacher cohorts to each of our PPS curriculum program specialists who will check in with their teachers weekly and provide office hours for extra support. Our PPS coordinators will support the sites with IEPs and parent questions or concerns, as well as help with the implementation of services. Director Pearson is also working with his staff to provide professional development opportunities for teachers based on their needs and specifically as they pertain to teaching in a virtual environment. Our asset man manager, Amber Duran, is currently reaching out to site librarians to assure that our special ed teachers have the necessary textbooks and resources in core content area as well. We will be reconvening the special ed task force on August 26th, and PPS will be hosting a virtual parent night on August 9th. Next slide, please. Similar to our students with disabilities, students receiving 504 accommodations will continue to receive support based on their current plan. 504 plans will be reviewed in the fall to assure that we are able to continue to provide services listed and teams will be reconvened in the event we need to make adjustments. 504 meetings will also be held via WebEx. Next slide. The ability to provide our students the necessary supports in this time of distance learning is critical. Teams are working to finalize the development of a weekly engagement record, as well as procedures for tiered re-engagement strategies as per the requirements of the trailer bill. Academic support will be provided in the form of virtual tutoring and office hours provided by individual teachers. Our mental health and counseling teams are preparing to provide the social, emotional, and mental health supports our students will need, and our mental health hotline will go live the week of August 31st. We have also developed a district level case management team, which sites can reach out to for basic needs and linkage to services. Sites have been encouraged to revisit their PBIS expectations and adjust them to reflect their expectations in a virtual <laughs> environment. Nutrition services will also re resume meal distribution as well. Next slide. So, um, I'm sorry, did I? Skip the, yeah, I think we skipped the slide. Um, Shane, if you can go back, I'll pick up from there. I'm sorry, I'm having a lag on my computer where I'm watching the slides. Apologize. Okay, okay um, just support for our English learners. Students will include designated integrated instruction each day. We began initial LPAC assessments in July, and they will continue as students enroll and the summit of LPAC will be administered from August to October. Earlier, we touched on the EL math professional development provided over the summer and ongoing PD through CJUSD Connect in Aluto, and we'll be providing support and training for our dual immersion programs as well. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the support for our EL parents, which include our different parent advisory committees that will continue to meet virtually the site ELAC and school site councils that will continue to meet monthly on sites. Next slide, please. We wanted to provide some information on technology and connectivity. Students will have access to Chromebooks and, will, and we will continue to distribute and exchange Chromebooks as needed throughout the year. 
The students or families that do not have internet will be provided hotspots to support this access and a new way of supporting families if needed will be parking lot Wi-Fi that is now available at all four middle schools. And we are working on purchasing and installing this at Ritchie Canyon Elementary due to some of the connectivity issues in that area. Rostering in ClassLink, which is our central dashboard for online, all online tools, ensures equitable access for all students. Next slide. Please. Textbook distribution is occurring at all sites. And we wanted to let the board know that we do have some delays due to publisher delays and delivery. Also, the state is still requiring the county to conduct Williams visits, which we have been preparing to be able to show student access to textbooks and materials in a distance environment. Finally, we do have support resources for teachers, students, and parents through our online portal, through email, our call center that we are working to put into action as well as um, as well as our as well as the call center. So please next slide, please. Did you want to go back over that slide, Ms. Corden? You're on mute now. <laughs> did you, I'm sorry, did you sure. want to go over that slide again? Or? Okay. I will. Thank you so much. Let's revisit what student support will look like. Um, again, teams are working to finalize the development of a weekly engagement record, as well as procedures for tiered re-engagement strategies, as per the requirements of the trailer bill. Academic support will be sub uh, provided by teachers um, in the form of office hours, as well as uh, the district is looking to provide virtual tutoring as well. Our mental health and counseling teams are preparing to provide the social, emotional, and mental health supports our students need, and our mental health hotline will go live on the week of August 31st. We've also developed a district level case management team, which sites can reach out to for basic needs and linkages to services. Sites have been encouraged to revisit their PBIS expectations and adjust them to reflect their expectations in a virtual environment. And nutrition services will resume meal distribution. Next slide. With regards to athletics and extracurricular activities, CIF released its guidelines on July 20th, which indicated that all sports will now fall into one of two. Fall and spring with fall sport competition beginning in mid-December, and spring competition beginning in March. I've met with the athletic directors who are working to develop a return to sport guidance document for CJUSD, but it is important to note that while CIF has provided guidance and projected competition dates, our intent is only to resume athletics when we have deemed it safe and appropriate to bring students physically back on campus for live in-person instruction. Next slide. So critical to the success of distance learning will be the staff support. As Dr. Peterson mentioned earlier, um, the Ed Services Division and EdTech TOAs have created a self-directed professional learning platform utilizing Aludo that we call CJUSD Connect. Teachers will be able to select various professional learning uh, topics based on their own personalized need. Our district CPSs will continue to be available to support staff on a variety of topics as well. Our partnership with Kaiser Permanente and the RISE program will assist teachers with, with social emotional learning resources for staff to access and incorporate into their classrooms. And our mental health department will continue to provide mental health services that staff may need for themselves, either individualized or in a group setting. As always, our IT department and the IT help desk will be a resource to help teachers and staff with the support they may need. Next slide. As was mentioned before, a tiered re-engagement plan must be implemented to address students who failed to participate at least 60% of the instructional days for that week. The main goal is to identify barriers to participation and provide supports to mitigate those barriers. We are currently working with a team of district stakeholders, which includes both classified and certificated staff on providing general guidance to principals as they work with their site teams to develop this re-engagement plan. And at this point, I will turn it over back to Dr. Peterson. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Overall parent engagement and support will include several parent meetings and trainings at the beginning of the school year as we and as we progress through the year. We hope to be able to provide support during the school day 
after school and, and in the evening in the form of tutoring through either a homework hotline or online process support. Here and on our website, we have links to various community resources as well as links to child care support. We'll be communicating with parents through our normal communication channels, which include letters home, Q communicate, social media, and our websites. Next slide, please. As part of the SB 98, there's a requirement for local licensed providers to provide learning loss plans. Our special education department will work through the IEP process to address learning loss in their students. District wide, we will be providing diagnostic assessments at the beginning of the school year to identify the learning loss of students in English language arts, mathematics, and English language development uh, since March. We will analyze these results and we will address this through our monitoring processes and through teacher vertical and grade level collaboration and their plans to mitigate these losses through instruction. Next slide, please. This leads us to our learning continuity and attendance plan or LCP. The areas of the plan include stakeholder engagement, in-person instructional offerings, distance learning program, mental health and social emotional well-being, pupil learning loss engagement and outreach, school nutrition, and increased or improved services for foster youth, English learners, and low-income students. The LCP takes the place of the LCAP for the 2020-2021 school year and is due on September 30th. This plan must be presented at two board meetings, one with the public hearing and the other with the approval. The requirements of the plan are still in draft format at the state level and are supposed to be finalized tomorrow, August 1st. We wanted to make the board aware that this would give us 30 days to write the plan, meet with all stakeholder groups and make changes prior to the first board meeting in September on the 3rd. There is a likelihood that this will be too short a timeline to complete this work and it may require us asking for a special board meeting later in September to complete the approval process before, before the deadline. Next slide, please. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Ingrid Munsterman, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Uh, good evening, Board President Haro, Board Members, Superintendent Miranda. On behalf of Human Resources, um, I would like to show our support for number one, the certificated staff. HR has facilitated a teacher survey. We gathered information on needs and wants of teachers for effective decision making, which was due on 728. So far, we have 855 responses to date. Our distance, uh, distance learning MOU, we developed an MOU in collaboration with Dr. Peterson, addressing all concerns uh, like safety, teaching models, collaboration, grading, attendance, etc. Substitute teaching, we are training our substitutes to prepare to sub for um, in the virtual teaching program. Our priority will be given to long-term credentialed sub to fill beginning of the year vacancies. We're continuing to hire and staff for vacant positions. We have constant communication with ACE to collaborate on needs. For our classified staff, we are uh, negotiating a COVID-19 MOU. We're addressing all concerns, safety, training, reporting, screening, sick time, etc. COVID reporting form was developed and constant communication with CSCA to collaborate on needs. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, in the general human resources changes, testing adjustments to adhere to current safety guidelines. Um, we're making sure there's social distancing, our masks required, um, computers sterilized after each use by employment only, more testing sessions with less applicants in each session. We have staggered work schedules. We're accepting online paperwork, which is new for us for TB certifications and renewals. And we are fingerprinting with guidelines and by appointment only. We have a new fingerprinting machine and we're eager to use that. We're participating in virtual college and career fairs in virtual interviewing and processes for critical paperwork to ensure employees' information is processed in a timely manner. Thank you. Good evening, board members and the member of the online public. Um, 
I'm Rick Jensen, the, direct, uh, the Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, and I will go over the outline that uh, business services will be doing to support our teachers, staff, and students returning to the classrooms. So at this time, maintenance and operations is working diligently on an abbreviated schedule to try to get all of our classrooms cleaned. At this time, the deep cleaning has uh, been performed about 50% of our of our sites and the other remaining sites, we estimate probably take another 20 days to complete with a three day half uh, teams working every other day to uh, complete all of the sites, probably over the next uh, seven weeks, we estimate. COVID-19 has really played a part in how slow this process is going. Uh, we are disinfecting sites when necessary. If there's been a uh, reported COVID-19 exposure or potential exposure, the site, uh, the teams go in and they apply an electrostatic spray that uh, kills bacteria and uh, viruses. We also are upkeeping the uh, lawns and fields, uh, especially the fields and lawns, because uh, we don't want overgrowth of our lawns uh, at this time. We want our sites to remain uh, that curb appeal, uh, uh, curb appeal appearance. And then, of course, our high priority work orders maintained so that uh, our sites are ready to open in working order. Uh, Purchasing print shop and work and warehouse. Uh, pr print shop is working diligently on uh, getting the hard copies of student handouts and first day packets ready to go. Uh, we are setting the accounts with Southwest Office Supply and Lakeshore Learning so that uh, teachers can order and have their supplies delivered to their sites. Uh, and then we'll uh, have to work on how those. Uh, Items are distributed to uh, students and staff. Uh, stockpile of PPE for staff and students. We received a bulk order from the county office, uh, and, and we should be able to maintain uh, a, a sizable inventory of both disposable masks and also cloth masks that we can hand out to staff and students. Next slide, please. For nutrition services, we're continuing to, continuing to work on our CEP or community eligibility program application, which will allow all of our students to eat for free, regardless of uh, economic status. So uh, currently we have 13 sites that are on the CEP program. The remaining 15 sites are in the line for approval, currently at the state level, uh, it is being worked on the, th the only caveat is that this approval from the state must be received before the 1st day of school. So, uh, hands and fingers and eyes are crossed to make sure that uh, this gets done on time. Uh, if not, then we will have to collect applications for the coming year. Uh, meals will be served at 9 sites, which is uh, more sites than we're doing last year during the summer with two teams on a rotating schedule, which will allow us in the event that there happens to be a COVID-19 exposure to those teams, that there will be uh, another team that could come on board and take over the food distribution of that site so that we don't have any stoppage. Lunch will include a breakfast meal scheduled from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So two meals will be provided each day. The non hungry waiver, uh, which allows us to uh, not have to uh, feed everybody in one setting. We can, we can have uh, parents and students drive up to the site and pick up food, uh, was renewed. So we can continue to distribute meals to families the way we have done last year and during the summer. However, the seamless summer waiver has not yet been renewed and uh, there are, um, the state level, um, there are advocates on our behalf working with the legislators to get that renewed. If it is not renewed and if CEP uh, is not approved, then we would need to collect families that are not in 
uh, eligible for free and reduced lunches. Next slide. For transportation, this is a, a challenge when students come back to school because uh, due to social distancing guidelines of six feet uh, or more, uh, it would require us to have fewer students on the buses. So uh, our transportation director, Eric Richardson, is working diligently and really hard on finding ways to, uh, to arrange the routes so that we can uh, carry as many students as possible without infringing on these guidelines. In addition, uh, to assist in this effort, we are looking at special bus routing software programs to not only make those routes more efficient, but also include other uh, enhancements such as tracking driver training and renewal of certifications and so forth. Uh, facilities, we uh, are continuing to work on the three or four construction projects throughout the district that should be finished around uh, the next uh, two months or so. So we have work going on at uh, Colton High School, Colton Middle School, on their cafeterias and uh, kitchens and multipurpose rooms. And also, uh, I think it's Terrace Hills uh, parking lot and uh, the administrative office over at Washington. And in addition, we continue to use our uh, energy management systems like iView and uh, the irrigation controls to make sure that all of our systems and HVAC and ventilation systems are working efficiently for the start of school. And finally, fiscal health management and our risk and our health benefits and risk management. Uh, they are assisting with the COVID-19 potential exposures and reporting that out and working with our employees who have been exposed. I am uh, I am proud to announce that so far we have any report of somebody getting sick at work. We have tracked all of these exposures and 100% of them have been uh, exposures outside of the district through family members or at events that are outside of the district. Our procedures and practices, uh, which are uh, being coded into an employee handbook to distribute to all employees and how we will ensure the health and safety during this unprecedented period uh, will help protect the district and the health of all our staff, our teachers and our students. Uh, in addition, uh, we are developing those policies and procedures to minimize that exposure at the workplace. And this takes care of the business services, and I believe I'll turn it back to Amanda. Actually, I'll take it from here. Uh, next slide, please. Mrs. Peterson, we need to switch our sign language interpreters again. Okay. Okay, we are good to go. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. At this point, we would just like to thank the board for allowing us to present um, to you tonight. And um, on behalf of executive cabinet, um, just again, reiterate our, our thankfulness to all of our teachers, admin, and everybody for their support throughout the summer and working hard to put all these plans together for everyone. And um, to the board, we, may we answer any questions you may have? Okay, so do we have any board members who wish to speak? I have a couple of questions. Joanne. Okay, Joanne, go ahead. Um, is it possible when the uh, uh, CJS, CJUSD connect <clears throat> as well as the parent meeting and trainings are being provided, we have access just to listen into those? Yeah, we can provide that. Okay. And also, um, I was. I think that employee handbook is a great idea, and I'm, I'm hoping that part of that will be to provide the district, the board members, a copy of of those protocols. Uh, we'll we can do that. Too. Go ahead, Rick. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> We will do that, uh, no problem. We also uh, intend to 
have the employees sign for the book so we know uh, who received a copy of it as uh, requested by board members last board meeting. Okay, great. Um, and then I know attendance is, is going to be really looked at carefully and I'm, will, will attendance become, be treated the same way it is during the school year um, when students are not going online and not doing what they need to be doing? Are we going to be doing the SART process or is that something just down the road we're gonna look at or what will happen to those kids who are not participating? So each school site will be responsible for um, developing their re-engagement strategies, but we did have that discussion about uh, continuing the SAR or SAR process. Um, there is some references out there that um, now is not necessarily the time to go straight into those um, methods of intervention, but really doing everything we can to engage in uh, the process of learning the why behind um, why they're not engaging. And so that's why we've been able to incorporate the um, addition of several team members within the student services division to visit the homes, to find out the why, to make phone calls and really try to link them to whatever it is or mitigate whatever it is that they are um, having issues with that is preventing them from engaging into that. Now, if we if we dial in and we are able to mitigate that and they're still making a decision not to engage, then we we should probably be considering those other strategies. But for right now, the big push is really just to kind of um, dig into the why and, and do everything we can to provide the resource that they need. Thank you. Um in looking at this report when I first got it, I I just just really kind of stand back and think about all that has gone into the preparation of this. And um, I know a lot of people are have so many questions, and I mean, fear is the biggest thing for all of us. For all of us, we we look at it, and we 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 have a hard time with it. But people who have to actually implement this, I'm sure, are at all different stages of change. Um, but as a board member, I need you to know that I realize the effort. I mean, you're totally redoing an entire educational program practically overnight, and there's going to be glitches. Um, but I am so impressed with the level and the and the type of responses that we've gotten for just about every question that I can think of, and I'm sure there's more. But I. I just want you to know that I realize the work involved and um, I just appreciate all that we've done. And I think our kids are getting the best that we possibly can give them at this time. And as they, we learn more, we do it differently. But um, just I wanted to say thank you to everyone for this amazing 39 page document that almost blew me away. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thoring Ojeda. Anyone else? I have some questions. This is okay, Frank. Mr. Ibarra. Thank you, Pat. First of all, I'd also like to just start off by thanking our administration, our superintendent, our teachers, and all the staff that worked really hard and diligently in putting this uh, uh, report and actually uh, redesigning a, our learning uh, um, experiences that we're going to be giving our students together for us and, and reviewing it with us because it answered and you were very, very good in answering a lot of the questions that I had as well. And I'm sure that a lot of the parents and students have as well as the staff. So I just want to say thank you to start off with. Uh, my mm -hmm. questions uh, relate around uh, about four different questions. First one is, um, if uh, someone could speak on teachers evaluations now i know that uh, the mou stated that uh, we will continue doing evaluations but uh, uh, i just want to make sure that uh, all the teachers who that will be evaluated this year are are uh, are being uh, you know told and and uh what to expect in the evaluations? Are, are we uh, starting to talk to those uh, principals who will be doing those evaluations? 
so that they could be properly prepared. This is different than a traditional educational setting. And I want all our teachers to do well as they're being evaluated. So can anyone uh, speak on that for me, please? Ms. <clears throat> Munson, do you want to address that? I can, Dr. Miranda. So, Mr. Barra, um, evaluations, yes. hello, our evaluations are the same. Um, the principals completed the evaluations last year. Um, we had almost everybody turn in their evaluations. So it's the way it was, and the, they're going to continue doing it the way they did. Okay, so the, there won't be any specific changes or notifications or anything based on the new uh, distant learning delivery of, of uh, the lesson. The evaluations go on. Everybody has the same timeline because that's ed code and we have to follow ed code. Okay. And so it's it's the same, Mr. Ibarra. Okay, well, thank you for answering that. And uh, it's the same how, document, right, Ingrid? Sorry, yes. sorry. Yes, okay. Dr. Amanda. Okay, how are we set for the state testing? Uh, is that going to continue? Uh, are, are we going to prepare for that in our scheduling? And, uh, you know, how are we going to uh, prepare our, our instructors, our teachers? to be prepared to do that type of testing for our students. So Mr. Barra can address that. Um, the state has not put out any uh, recommendations or said anything specific with regard to um, assessments at this point. So uh, we will continue to um, go forward as if they're all testing will still occur this year. Um, I would imagine at some point over the next couple months that um, there will be um some information given to us as far as either we're continuing with status quo or the changes that they're going to that they will be making so we will continue our efforts on our end to provide assessments um of our assessments of what our students are are achieving and how they're and how they're performing formative and summative um as well as preparing as needed for our um state tests if they do occur in in the spring Okay. okay, thank you for that as well. Um, uh, I think you, you touched on, someone touched on uh, the training and development, and I was specifically looking at uh, preparing our substitute uh, teachers for the training uh, for distant learning so they could be available to our district. And when are we uh, set to start uh, working with our uh, substitute teachers so that they could start being trained to be prepared for our students. Mr. Ibarra, I, I mentioned the substitute training. Um, we had a meeting to collaborate with um, Ed Services last week or at the beginning of this week. We're dividing our substitutes and those that are going to be long term, those that already have experience in um, distance learning, and then those that are going to be the day to day subs. So training will occur in small increments, but um, we have train we have subs that are fully credentialed, and um, we are going to start with them. And at the beginning of the school, of course, we have the the big the vacancies are filled with subs until we know how many students there are and uh, what teacher need we have. And so the teacher the we anticipate the subs that go in those classrooms to be the long term subs. Okay, thank you for for that. And then my final question had to do with advanced placement. As uh, I spoke with Dr. Miranda earlier today, uh, Odysseyware does not provide a, a format for advanced placement. And uh, are we at this point uh, looking for some type of advanced placement software or uh, something that we could utilize, or are we going to rely on our advanced placement teachers to put uh, a curriculum together to be approved uh, so it could be uh, available for delivery uh, online? So, Mr. Mr. Ibarra, uh, we are going to work with our uh, teachers when they return to find if we have any uh, volunteers that would like to do possibly do an additional period um, that where they would work with our facilitated online learning students. 
um, on an AP course, uh, we may not be able to offer all AP courses, but um, trying to offer the 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 some of the core um, core AP courses, we'll be working towards that end uh, to be able to provide those to our students. And so, um, you need the teachers to be back uh, back in order to uh, have those conversations and and um, set that up. Okay, thank you, Tina, for that. And one last uh, comment. I just want to, to uh, commend the whole staff who put this together and uh, for adding and providing support services uh, for our educators, our teachers, our staff, uh, for our students as far as tutoring and uh, our parents as well. And uh, I just want to say you guys did an excellent job as far as I can see. I know this is just the beginning and I know that uh, we're in for a lot of different challenges. And uh, like I always say that, uh, you know, our district has some wonderful employees that can do wonderful things. So uh, I have a lot of confidence and I always have in, in uh, each and every one of you and those who are not listening as well. So I just want to say thank you uh, for the hard work and and we're here to support and and assist in any way. So thank you, Pat. And that's all my questions. Thank you, Board Member Ibarra. Do we have any other questions by any board members? Questions or comments? Uh, I do. This is Dan. Uh, OK, may. Mr. Forrest. Thank you. Uh, and again, I'm, let me echo what uh, has been said with respect to putting together the presentation. Uh, very impressive, great job. We covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time, um, particularly given that things are changing very quickly. So I wanna thank staff, Dr. Miranda and cabinet, but everybody that touched this, this plan, knowing full well that we may see changes along the way, knowing full well there may be something that we missed, but we will, uh, we will make sure that we cover it and we find solutions as we work our way through this. A number of questions. I'm going to work my way backwards uh, and try to be as succinct as possible because there's a lot covered. Um, with respect to lack of participation, Board Member Thorin Ojeda's question, um, how are we going to track that and how quickly are we going to be able to respond to when we see hotspots, if you will, either school sites or areas where we see high numbers of students not participating? That's something that's really important to me because I really want to make sure that we're catching that early, so that we can provide support and make adjustments. So how are we going to track that in real time? So I can answer that, Dr. Miranda. Um, based on just attendance alone, there's there's a lot of language about attendance versus engagement versus you know a lot of different elements, but based on just the attendance piece, um, we will be running weekly reports and we will be addressing any student who fails to participate with the, um, with the minimum of that 60% threshold. Now, part of the discussion we had is that we have created a system and in order to fulfill the elements of the student engagement record, we do have to track not only physically um, showing up in a live setting, but are they engaged in um, in participating in assignments? Are they engaged in um, having conversations outside of that you know, 30 minutes or whatever the live interaction is. So because the part of what they're deciding is, um, you know, allowing a student a few days to submit assignments, we are able to go back and change attendance from say negative to positive once the assignment is, is turned in so that will count as engagement. What we talked about in the attendance group is that um, even though the assignment, the student didn't physically show up that day, the student is marked absent. The student didn't show up the next day, the student is marked absent. Even though a week later, the student may turn in an assignment and kind of address those absences, we're still gonna generate the phone calls home daily like we do in a regular setting. We're still gonna try to intervene um, when they didn't show up those initial two or three days during that week, regardless of whether or not the attendance is retracted or corrected based on of submission of assignments. So we are going to be very diligent about running those weekly reports and kicking in whatever um, tiered re-engagement strategies the school has come up with 
and really involving the people. I mean, we talked about, we had a great conversation about engaging the office staff, engaging the health assistants, engaging the nurses, the district community liaisons, um, pulling all people, you know, all hands on deck to try to get these students engaged, especially day one and day two um, next week and really nailing down, you know, what, what are the barriers and how can we make this work? And would it be possible to provide that information to the board just in its aggregate form? Obviously, we don't need to know student names or even IDs, but just by, as you have in the past, uh, broken down by grade level, um, so that we have an idea of where we may see some some challenges. That would be helpful. I would be interested in seeing that on a, a pretty regular basis, especially early on. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions for business uh, related business services. So, Mr. Jensen, um, uh, you noted transportation. Obviously, that's going to be a unique situation to start off with. Um, given that we're going to go distance learning and then potentially transition to hybrid. Just want to make a mention if we can continue to work with our drivers. Uh, yeah. You know, they usually have a bidding process that they go through to select routes and there's a whole process there. So I just know that there's some questions around that. We just make sure that we address that with uh, uh, Eric Richardson's working on that. I just wanted to make mention of that. The PPEs though, where, where are we on PPE? Sounds like we have a stockpile, but it's difficult to come across certain items. Are we, uh, if we can get some detail on the stockpile and do we have, so are we direct sourcing that with vendors or are we relying on say the county and the county stockpile that it has through its office emergency services um, or some other source? Uh, great question. We have been uh, searching several vendors for all, all of our PPE needs, whether it be masks or gloves, we're not counting on what we get from the county. That's basically icing on the cake. So everything that we've been doing, we have our sources that we've been reaching out to. And as you know, in the beginning, it was very hard to come by uh, the masks that we needed. Uh, there are more available now than there were before. And we will include in the board communication uh, some details about what our stockpiles look like at this time. And so we will continue to do that. We will have both cloth masks that are washable, and then we'll have disposables on hand for, let's say, those who come to school and forget their mask. So we want to encourage the cloth uh, face coverings first, and we can rely upon the disposable. Okay, great. Thank you. And I, I just know, again, that's uh, going to be extremely important for our employees that we provide them with the appropriate PPE. You know, I'll, I'll end with one last question that I know we have some parents that are watching and certainly are, are engaged and wondering. Um, it was shared with us sort of the the uh, template, if you will, of, of time and how we spend uh, engaging or interacting with the students. It was, I'll be honest, a little convoluted. I'm wondering if someone can just share an example, if you will, because uh, I think for what most parents are asking, myself included, what will my students they actually look for? How, how much time will they likely spend online directly engaging with their teacher? How much time will they likely spend doing assignments alone? Can you give us and the parents that are watching kind of a, an example of a day in the life of a student in this kind of new environment? Um, it'd be helpful to probably break it down by elementary versus secondary, but I, I think people would appreciate getting at least a, a flavor of what will the day look like? And, uh, how long will I have to be online with my kid versus working with them one on one versus um, and, and for those that have multiple students, as we do, trying to manage all of them. So for the um, for the elementary, um, it is, you know, we, we provided on the schedule, the different time allotments. Um, for the different subject areas um, in in the nitty gritty of the MOU talks about um, like a minimum of one hour of live instruction, um, like 15 minutes within subject areas um, that will be kind of adaptable each each day. There's a fit, that 15 minute more morning meeting is expected to be live. Um, and so there'll be varying degrees of that. But it, um, for the most part, the discussion centered around about a minimum, a minimum of one hour instruction and it just depends on the day at, at that point. Um, I think uh, for secondary, you know, they're set up by periods, so um, you should see, and there's live, live instruction is required daily. So with it, within a 45 minute period, um, again, we've, we're, we're looking at different times. It's hard to set the, it's hard to set a minimum at that, at that point when you're looking at a 45 minute period with, with students, because um, that can vary from day to day. 
Um, so, um, but within each period, there needs for secondary, there needs to be um, live instruction time during the, during the period, and then ultimately the cum the accumulation of live instruction time and um, asynchronous or live instruction with this which is synchronous and then asynchronous on their own. Um, there needs to be uh, 240 minutes of instructional time for um, secondary or grades four through 12, um, 230 minutes for K through three, or excuse me, one through three, and 180 <coughs> minutes for um, PK and kindergarten. And so, um, so it's hard to, we didn't settle on a set specific time in, in, as far as secondary goes um, due to the fact that the periods are are different lengths throughout throughout the week and and um, um, depending on what's happening there, but it is required that there is live instruction every day. So, uh, Dr. Peterson, for elementary students are going to be checking in every morning with the teacher right off the bat, fifteen minutes, and then uh, depending on the the throughout the day, the whatever ELA or math, they'll then they'll come back and. And do some live instruction at some point. There's, I think, a minimum of one hour. That's right. Throughout yeah, that's what we. That, yeah, that's what we're looking at. So that 15 minute morning meeting is is live, and so the, um, they should start off every day with that. It, right. I hope, and, that answers, I hope that helps, uh, Mr. Flores. It, <laughs> it, it does. It does. I think it gives at least some sense. And obviously, it's a moving target. So we'll, we'll yeah. work it. Um, you know, I, one last question that did come up, I, I, you mentioned having homework hotline and help for our parents. What about um, from an IT standpoint? Because obviously we're going to be asking folks to log in and it's not just logging in, it's the middle of assignments. There's a number of platforms that we're using that we experienced during the last uh, distance learning session. Will we have a, a, an IT hotline or something available if parents are having difficulty with technology? So we have, um, we have a help desk which is uh, through uh, email format. And then we also are, are I, I, I'm hesitant to say our call center is up and going because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's ready. We're just not sure if there's gonna be uh, hiccups with it once we implement. And so um, it's a work in progress. And so we'll, we'll get, we will get more information to, to the board as that, that goes. But the ultimate goal is that we have a help a helpline for um, parents to call in, a help desk for parents to email um, questions to, and then support um, support that way within that. Um, during teacher office hours, that's time where teachers can help um, as far as support parents with the instruction. Uh, we're looking at you know the various options for tutoring. Um, we're trying to think outside the box and how we can use poss the possibility while teachers are teaching during the day using subs to do some of that um, and then also providing as we said um, some night night possibilities for teachers to do extra duty and be tutoring at night to support support students as well so uh, we are open to um, as we keep going as i said uh, we want our students to be successful uh, we learned a lot from the last three months of last year's school year and I think there's, you know, as we see opportunities and as we, as the teachers come back and we get chances to have conversations, um, those things will start to get implemented and we'll start to see uh, see that. And we just, you know, we keep, we'd like to just reiterate um, patience on all ends, um, mm -hmm. patience uh, for our teachers, patience for admin, patience for the, for, uh, um, for our students and, and patients with our with parents as well um, as we go through the next few weeks because there will be a lot of moving parts and um, probably some some extremely successful items and, and probably a couple failures along the way that will we will uh, work to improve on and and also let me mention the uh, family the the trainings for that are coming up for parents that uh, ed service is going to put on a uh, hundred la torre uh, and that's going to be more on the uh, mechanics and how to manipulate a computer for our parents and how to get online, how to access Google Classroom. We did those in the past, but uh, or and we'll do them again uh, coming up pretty soon here uh, in English and Spanish uh, for our parents for sure. Uh, so there'll be a lot of support for uh, for our parents to access the, the programs and the the computers.
Right. Thank you. I just would ask them that we make sure we have all that information uh, easily accessible on our website, Facebook page, because I know when you're in the middle of trying to log in or, or get something done, you're not sure where to go. It'd be great to be able to just refer folks to the website where there's a banner, a big button that you can click on, with the phone numbers, emails, et cetera. So making that accessible for our parents would be great. Great job, everybody. This was incredible. Okay. And there will probably be a couple of bumps in the road as, as there uh, want to be with something like this, but you guys have done a phenomenal job. Thank you. Here's all. Thank you, uh, Board President Harm. Thank you, board, board Member Flores. Do any of our other board members have any questions? Board yes, Member Adegui. Board yes. Member Adegui. Yes, thank you. Okay, I also want to echo um, my, my fellow board members for the thorough and comprehensive plan. Um, the, the way the departments put this together um, is truly amazing. Uh, starting with Ms. Munsterman with the HR piece and Ms. Corridan with the social emotional uh, focus and the logistics and Mr. Jensen, the business part and, and Ms. Peterson, the, the instructional piece, it's, um, it's truly um, impressive. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, in a few short days, our kids are going to be um, on, on the screen and it's gonna be very different for all of us. And I'm talking as a grandma, I, for, for years, I walked my, my grandchildren to school on the first day and we we'll put them on the bus and waved. And um, now I'm going to be right along with a lot of other grandparents who are going to be, um, mm -hmm. you know, sitting in front of the screen with the grandchildren and trying to, you know, to navigate through this. So um, uh, my first question is um, uh, regarding the, you know, the, the first few days of school, um, you know, the teachers are going to have a lot of little faces on the screen and, and you know, it's like, what, what now? Um, I think they are going to be um, the, the huge task that teachers are going to have, first of all, is, um, is um, finding out where the kiddos are. Um, where I'm talking instructionally. Um, the to mitigate the the learning learning loss of where they were in March and where they're at now um, they're showing up on our um, you know on our screen and we have to quickly without spending um, hours and hours of assessment um, but um, we have to figure out where the kids are so that teachers have a starting place for the kids. So my question is, is there, a, is there a plan in place as far as how we're going to be um, finding out uh, where our kids are so that teachers can plan accordingly? So uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the requirements of even our, uh, the learning continue, continuity and attendance plan or continuity and attendance plan was that we um, have a way of uh, assessing learning loss and so, um, we have, uh, we will be beginning the year um, providing a diagnostic assessment at all levels to some form of diagnost diagnostic assessment at each level in order to obtain information um, regarding learning loss or where they're at with regard to English, uh, ELA, uh, math, and English language development um, in order to, we, we, uh, in order to get started. Okay, that's and so great. And um, it's also good to see that there there will be collaboration time for teachers to discuss students and, and where they're at also. Okay, um, my, my next question is on the facilitated online learning update. Um, I know there are very, uh, there, there are a lot of concerns and there are a lot of uh, reservations regarding this program and how we're going to be implementing it. So um, I would like to, uh, first of all, um, you know, just uh, I know that's the option that we have tonight on um, approving the Odyssey Wear as our, our facilitated online learning uh, program. Um, and what I would like to see is, um, is can we, you know, that's our base program. Can we go from there and enhance it and make it workable for us so that our students are provided with support, number one, and uh, can we make it rigorous, engaging, and interactive as much as possible? And what is the support going to look like for for um, for the students in this program? 
<laughs> and so um, we provided a little bit of that information. And so I'll, I'll kind of go through. Um, we are looking at, like, if we are looking at, uh, as we implement uh, facilitated yeah. online learning, we will look, be looking to do yeah. absolutely what you said. What kinds of improvements can we make to to um, improve this? Um, we'll also be looking throughout the first semester, you know, is there another option out there that possibly, you know, that we could, we could implement second semester. Um, uh, we will be um, looking at our part of the unknown is not knowing what teachers will have available. And so we're just in the process of going through as they come back and as, as, as we uh, see which teachers we we're going to be including in this, in this program. Uh, this is where the where we'll be able to determine some of the supports that we're getting. So we are looking, you know, our ELD students or EL students that are in this program. We're we are looking for um, the possibility of putting those students with an ELD teacher so they can get their ELD supports on a daily basis. Um, and so um, outside of outside of the supports that the main teacher holds, this is where the tutoring, the ideas and and things for tutoring come in as far as. The possibility of, um, you know, we have subs. That, some subs have um, credentials in certain areas. Some subs have, you know, their their strength in certain areas. And so, um, looking at and or just teachers in general, if we pay extra duty for tutoring, is to be able to provide options in each of the core areas. So, if students are taking these classes, they would have someone to go to to ask for help um, and get some tutoring. Um, if the if that's not the the um, you know strong area or strong support um, for of, of their teacher that that they're working with, and so <laughs> the goal is to provide as much support as possible for these students and provide as many opportunities for them to get the help that they need. And so we will um, as we as we begin this program and as we as we're setting up um, the tutoring aspects and and the support for this, we will continue to. Um, you know, we're open to ideas as well, and we will continue to uh, work through that to improve the program throughout the semester, as well as see if uh, there are other options um, that might be um, a better uh, option for second semester. Um, you know, with the amount of time we had to do this and the, the time it takes to vet a program, um, select teachers, train teachers, and, and begin offering that, that instruction that um, we just, the time frame we had was just not, not there. Okay, and as we move forward, um, I would like to see, we have a lot of experts in our district, secondary experts uh, in um, different areas, and we also have our, our secondary curriculum council who uh, is very, um, you know, very focused on, on secondary and making these um, and helping us strengthen our programs. And I would like to see if, if we can engage the secondary, secondary curriculum council in, in looking at this program closely and, and, uh, and see what recommendations they have to enhance it. And also, you know, looking at the course descriptions and see how, again, we can make them more uh, workable for our students. Okay. And one, of, and that was one of actually I'm, one of I'm the sorry, promises I, we made. Uh, we need to switch interpreters really quick. Oh, okay. We will pause for space station identification at this time. <laughs> All set. Okay. 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 And go ahead, Dr. Peterson. Um, I was just going to say that we did, um, we did just so you're aware, we did schedule, uh, we did have an emergency meeting with school site council, or sorry, curriculum secondary curriculum council. Uh, we're aware of, of their their um, apprehensions with this as, as well, and and um, we we did get an understanding from them that that they supported the fact that they understood we needed to use this program, and that we would work together to make improvements throughout the year. Um, so I made that I made that promise to them personally, and I intend to uh, um, keep that promise. And so um, we'll work with the council to uh, or the secondary curriculum council to absolutely make that make that happen and see how we can improve things. Okay, and I personally would like some uh, updates periodically, you know, in, within the next few weeks yeah. to see how we're moving forward. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much. And what uh, I'll just add really quick that. Uh, what the uh, the Odyssey Aware program would 
what you know is that we've uh, in, looked at enhancing it and then providing all those extra supports above and beyond uh, that will support the students in that program, like Dr. Peterson said, uh, and reaching out to, of course, our, our teachers and is and it's going to be very important to ensure that uh, we meet the needs uh, of those students and uh, and so we have a commitment with uh, the curriculum council to explore again uh, embedding out uh, programs that are out there. Uh, there is no perfect program that's out there. However, uh, we are doing what the best and we put together the best program for our students that are going to be part of the facility online program. Uh, uh, at this time, and, and we are committed to improving it and enhancing it, and and if, and if needed, at some point, uh, uh, having to transition to something else if we think it's in the best interest. But uh, again, uh, so uh, we will be working and updating you uh, uh, regular basis on where we're at with that process. Thank you. Thank you, board member Adegin. Do we have any further questions for uh, board member Sandoval or board member Fuentes? Yeah, I have one quick comment and one question real quick. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. This is a great presentation, a great plan. I'm just going to ditto uh, what my colleagues have said. They've already asked uh, many of the questions that I have written down, but just one more question uh, for Rick. Uh, I know you were, uh, we're still waiting on the CEP to be approved. For our students to receive lunches, but uh, for some reason, let's say it does not get approved and we have to start the application process. Will the parents be able to continue to pick up lunches until we look at those applications? Rick, you're muted. Oh, sorry, I, I uh, muted myself and then quickly re muted myself. So, uh, just so that parents are aware, all of all, they will all be eligible to pick up meals on day one. Okay. Okay. We go off their prior year eligibility, I believe, for the first 60 or 90 days. Uh, if Eric uh, can update me on that really quick, I can tell you for sure. So, um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, I may have mentioned every child will receive a breakfast and a lunch every single day. We'll look at the possibility of doing maybe several days in advance, but right now the constraint is the size of our facilities to do that. I also want to mention that because last year we had the ability to be able to put the meals like in the trunks of the cars or the, the, they walked up and picked up their meals uh, at a table. The, somebody will need to exit the car and go into the facility uh, to pick up their uh, meals. And this is a requirement that uh, because one of the waivers did not pass uh, requires them to do it in this way, but can still take those meals home to their children. That's your question. Yes, Rick, thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure that our parents under, understood that. Uh, that they'll have to get out and uh, actually walk in and pick up their uh, their lunches, and that uh, lunches will be uh, lunches and breakfast will be available for them because it's one of the key things in making sure our students are are do have something to eat and something that will help them with their education pro educational process. But once again, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation, and uh, I'm sorry, Rick, you were saying. Yeah, I, I wanted to add one more thing because I think this is important for everybody to understand is the reason why uh, they have to get in, go into the facility is because we have to identify every student uh, because some students are in paid status, some students are free and reduced. So that would be the time we would have to collect money at that time if CEP does not pass. Okay. And uh, would okay. the student have to get down or the parent would be okay to, to pick up uh, their lunch? Um, somebody has to stay in the car, so more okay. likely a student or another family member, as long as they can identify the student either by name or their student number. Uh, either way, I think they can identify the student that would be fine. Okay. Okay. Just to make that clear so the parents understand uh, the process that's going to be uh, happening. So, 
But once again, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate all of you, uh, all the, uh, staff, district staff, uh, HR, uh, student services, uh, uh, all the assistant, uh, soups, uh, commu uh, the uh, executive cabinet, everybody. Thank you. Uh, you've all done a phenomenal job. I am very proud of uh, our district and I'm very proud of everyone, including our parents and our students for uh, doing what needs to be done at this point. Uh, you know, the safety of everyone is a key right now and we want to make sure everyone's safe. Thank you very much. Any further questions by any board members? Um, seeing none, I'm just going to uh, say my comments real quick in regards to our presentation. Uh, first of all, it's already been said, but I want to reiterate. Um, I want to thank our assistant soups and Dr. Miranda for the 39 page document that we were presented today. The presentation. Um, I want to thank, uh, especially uh, Ms. Peterson to, for today adding that uh, 39th page in regards to uh, being uh, eligible, the CIF and all of the additional information that we were given. I think it was really important for um, the public and our parents to understand uh, what uh, what the facilitated online learning options um, and how they're going to meet and support their students with the CS, the UC approval, the electives, all the different things. They needed to know that. And I'm grateful for you adding that additional page today at the last minute. Um, as I said, when we did uh, agenda review and this was uh, presented to me in uh, in a in a work, it was a still working document at that time. Um, I am, I, you know, I support what the decision, the, de the decision we're doing, but I'm not happy with the decision about the Odyssey wear. Um, I, I, I know we didn't have a choice, and um, I, I will support it. But I honestly, I, I agree. I hope that we continue to uh, work with secondary curriculum. Uh, council our, and and listen to our secondary teachers because um, they deal with this on a daily basis and they can give us some insight to the pros and cons of not only this program but also other programs that are possibly out there that might work better. Um, I I have full confidence that our our teachers can can give us. Um, assistance in that. Um, I'm grateful that we are going to have tutors to work with these students and that we're going to have a helpline and that we're going to have uh, our substitute teachers uh, hopefully working on that helpline to help these students with these subjects and all the extra support that we're going to offer. But um, it's nothing like having an actual teacher teaching the program. And I know right now we can't do that with because of COVID bringing teachers and students back to the classroom. But um, I just want to reiterate that we need, we need to look and see what other programs are out there that could possibly work better for our students. Uh, I wanna thank each and every one of you who worked on this document. It was concise. Um, I think that uh, even with the questions that you were asked this evening after just to clarify a few things, everything was there from every department. And I'm extremely, extremely grateful to each and every one of you. I know a lot of you where you've been, again, I say it again, working on the weekends to make sure all these things were done, uh, the MOU, everything. And so again, uh, my sincere thank you. And so those are my comments regarding 3.0. And with that, Mrs. I wanna move. Yes, ma'am. I, I had my mute button on before you started and I wanted to ask two clarifying questions if I could. Yes, of course. Okay. <clears throat> um, when Mrs. Aragain asked the question, Ms. Ms. Peterson, about the um, where students are at now, and you responded that there's an assessment um, that students will be given, is that something that each teacher then will be expected to do the first day or two of school, or how will that information, is that an online assessment that they take and they'll, the data will be given to them, or how is that going to work? Um, so the SARP will, will provide that information. Most of the, I believe most of the diagnostics are online. Um, I know for elementary, I believe it's through iReady. 
Um, and then there's part of um, secondary. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's, uh, it, I know we have um, Frank Alex, our Alex math program that we're gonna be doing, doing that with. And um, I'd have to get more information from, I can provide that to you guys in board correspondence, but it is, okay. in, it is in our MOU with the teachers that we um, listed that diagnostic needs to be provided. Um, it is part of our learning continuity plan um, that requires um, requires that we uh, find or find a, an assessment of learning loss. And so um, we will be providing that diagnostic to, uh, and then the results to teachers uh, for their collaboration and, and review. So the teachers will be assigning that like the first day or so the kids would have to take it online and then the data would go in and be collected. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it should be during the first few days. Um, I know, you know, the first first day is always chaotic. The first right, few days. Right, yeah, that's crazy. I, yeah, um, I, I, sorry, so yeah. first within the first two weeks, how about that? <laughs> yeah, okay. And yeah, my, first two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> my, my second clarification question is, and I'm so glad that Mr. Uh, that Dan asked this question um, because um, being at school and doing what they need to be doing is so important um, for learning, obviously. Um, he asked about the amount of time that students will be actually being given lessons online. And I'm wondering if each teacher, if this is part of the memorandum of uh, MOU, um, Will each teacher then maybe have a schedule posted that you know, at this time, everyone's starting at eight o'clock with a 15 minute meeting. And then there, you know, this group will be back online at X time every day so that it's kids need schedules to get, kids and parents especially are gonna need schedules to know when and what is expected um, throughout the week. And I'm wondering if that's something that will be assumed to be provided or is that, how will that be? Because that can be really confusing. That's um, also within the, that's within the MOU, and it's um, teachers by Monday more by the their prep period Monday will provide the weekly um, a weekly schedule um, within. Uh, I think most people do it within their Google Classroom, and so that their students have access. Students and parents would have access to that. Okay, I, I assume that was true, but I want to make sure because I I can see parents out there thinking, "How are we going to do this?" Um, and it'll get easier once, but everything new and change is hard. So I just wanted to make, get clarification on that. Thank you again. All of you. That's it. Thanks, Mrs. Thank Brown. you, Thor Board Member Thoring Ojeda. Okay, seeing no other questions regarding the administrative presentation, we're going to move on to our action session 4.0. We have items 4.1 through 4.5. Are there any that need to be pulled for separate consideration? 4.2, please. 4.2, okay. Are there any others? Okay, so do I have a motion to approve action items 4.1 through 4.5 without 4.2? So move, Frank. Sec second that, uh, Israel. Any questions on 4.1 or 4.3 through 5? Seeing none, moving on. Um, I have a motion by board member Ibarra and a second by board member Fuentes to approve action items 4.1, 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5. All, uh, sorry, roll call vote, Joanne. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Mr. Reynojeda? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Arigui? Yes. Thank you. On a motion by board member Ibarra and a second by board member Fuentes and carried on a 7-0 vote, the board approved action items 4.1 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5. Action item 4.2. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll make Same a motion. Move. Anne. I'll second. Okay. 
I have a motion by board member Flores and a second by board member Araguin to approve action item 4.2. Any discussion? Yes, I just wanted uh, to, to make sure that this is given the highest priority uh, with bringing on um, school site council and um, working together with them to show to make some improvements or changes to the program as we move forward um, before and uh, you know hopefully very soon because uh, the semester is going to go by fast and we just need to act quickly so that that's all okay any other comments regarding 4.2 uh, that was for the curriculum council correct the secondary curriculum council yes, yes. right okay I, I think that's really an important piece as well so yes Yes, and I too I, I agree with you also that this needs to be addressed right away because um, our students deserve it. And I agree also. Okay, thank you. Also. Okay. And, and Dr. Peterson, I know you said that you they've had discussion on this and I greatly appreciate um, that information and I, and I hope they continue to do that and I appreciate you giving us that information. Okay. Okay, I have a motion by board member Flores and a second by board member Araguin to approve action item 4.2. Joanne, can I have a roll call vote, please? Dan Flor Mr. Flores? Yes. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? No. Ms. Dorian Ojeda? Yes. Ms. Sandoval? Um, yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Arifi? Yes. Thank you. On a motion by board member Flores and a second by board member Araguin and carried on a 6-1 vote, the board approved action item 4.2. And with that, we are adjourned until next Thursday for our regular board meeting. Thank you everyone for your participation this evening and good night. Have a good night everyone. Thank you. Be safe everybody. Thank you. Take care. Yes. Take care. Take care. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> safe drive. <laughs> right. Catherine, thank you so much. I think we're good. And thank you also, Jessica. Appreciate your assistance tonight. No problem. Have a good one. Bye, Joanne. Good night, Shane. Okay, it's not letting me leave the meeting. <laughs>